Hello there and welcome to Newsline. It is a Tuesday, June 10th. I'm Catherine Kobayashi in Tokyo. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi have discovered a new challenge in their efforts to decommission the nuclear plant. They've found the level of water in one of the reactors is lower than they thought. They say they don't know whether it even covers all the nuclear fuel inside. The workers use robotic probes to measure the level and temperature of cooling water inside the vessel. They'd used pictures taken two years ago to estimate that the water was 60 centimeters deep. Now. They found it's only around 30 centimeters. Still, officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company say the temperature is around 35 degrees Celsius. And they say that suggests it's keeping the melted fuel cool. They suspect water is leaking through a pipe into a unit called a suppression chamber. They believe it's flowing through holes in the chamber, then out of the reactor building. Workers are planning to plug the holes, then they'll add water to the vessel and remove the fuel from the reactor. From KQED News, I'm Mina Kim. More than 100,000 former residents of Fukushima, Japan, remain displaced more than three years after a massive earthquake and tsunami caused a meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Today, California Senator Barbara Boxer raised concerns the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wasn't doing enough to protect the U.S. from a similar disaster. In Japan, the government is forging ahead with plans to decontaminate and reopen an area currently deemed a no-go zone. But former residents have mixed feelings about returning, writes Yuri Kagayama, an Associated Press reporter in the Tokyo Bureau. Kagayama was in the Bay Area last week to advise a group of San Francisco State University journalism students who will be traveling to Fukushima. I asked her how the cleanup work was progressing. Unfortunately, not much has changed over the three years. There is a lot of rebuilding, but they're still in a state of limbo. A lot of the people who have evacuated are living in temporary housing or those who have found new homes. They still have attachments, emotional attachments to their homes that they left behind in Fukushima. There's a lot of unresolved issues, such as are they going to get compensated for the homes? Is it going to be the radiation decontaminated enough so that they can return to their homes? There's an ongoing effort to return the people to these areas that are no-go zones right now, but they're being decontaminated. So there are a lot of unresolved issues. And what exactly is involved in the decontamination process? Decontamination means that they're removing the soil or the foliage that have the radiation and they're being put into huge bags and put in open vacant lots such as baseball fields. And also because the radiation is still leaking from the plants into the water, it may be in the food, the fear still remains. Is there also fear about whether to trust the government? I mean, the government doesn't have an incentive to declare the area safe. The more people they can get to return, to, the, to their homes, and the more area they can say, declare safe, they, they have less compensation to pay. That's, that's true. And that will be good for the Fukushima economy. So there's a lot of invested interest at stake to have as much of the area declared safe as possible. And that just adds to the distrust and the fear. And the other thing is 
radiation is still unexplored territory. There aren't that many nuclear disasters. There's Three Mile Island, there's Chernobyl, and there's Fukushima. And a lot of questions remain unanswered. People are worried about getting sick, and there are people, there are really people getting sick, including uh, thyroid cancer, which is what happened after Chernobyl. But there's no direct proof that this is from Fukushima. And we may never know, because it is very difficult to, to link individual sicknesses with whatever caused that sickness. So the fear just keeps building, the distrust keeps building, and, and these people are still there living every day with that uncertainty. How would you say trust of the government has changed as a result of this incident? Is it at a level of distrust that's unprecedented? I think distrust of the government is prevalent in many societies, including our American society. So I don't think Japan is any more distrustful than a lot of other societies. But when there is a traumatic and historic event like a nuclear disaster, then it's a challenge for any government to be transparent and accountable and deal with the consequences. There's a lot of pressure on these people not to complain. And also there's a lot of pressure on them to say their lives are back in order, that we are over the disaster. And a lot of these, these pressures are well-intentioned. They want to get the recovery going. So then all this works to have the government appear to them. The perception is prevalent that the government is playing down the bad things and being upbeat about the positive things. In addition to the health consequences, how has this affected the quality of their lives? In Fukushima, many people were farmers or fishermen or they had large homes. They operated their own businesses. This, these are not urban dwellers like the people in Tokyo or San Francisco. Fukushima people had strong ties to the land or the uh, homes that they lived in. So being in temporary housing or having to be separated from those communities is a bigger loss than for urban people. And also the other thing is because Fukushima tended to be a rural area, the, a lot of the residents are older, so it's harder for them. Some of the younger people have, have already found new jobs or moved to another town. Is there still a lot of interest in this story in Japan? I wish there were more interest because the people of Fukushima are extremely worried about being forgotten. This is an important story. It's probably the biggest story of my life. I've been with AP for more than 20 years, and I think it's up to us reporters to make sure that this important story is not forgotten. What advice are you giving to the San Francisco State students who want to report in the region? I try to be honest about the radiation risks because I, I they are young people and I would not want them to be uh, un unnecessarily exposed or not know what they're getting themselves into. Um, I don't want to sound alarmist or scare scare anybody, but these, this is real. So uh, they, they they should know that a lot of it a lot of it is uncertain. The other thing is they are not used to uh, interviewing Japanese people using an interpreter, so they have those logistical reporting tips that they're looking for me, and also how best to approach the Fukushima issue. How do you manage the unknown as a reporter? Yeah, I think maybe I should worry more, because when I did go with this family for my recent story, visiting their home in the no-go zone, because they were going, I went, my photographer and I also went to that no-go zone, and we, we wore gear just like they did. We just went the same way they did. But I didn't, I didn't think of that. I didn't question that because these are the people I was, I was covering, so I went the same, same places they did. Um, when they wore protective gear, I wore protective gear just like them. But I, the risks that I'm taking are nothing compared to the risks that my other colleagues are taking when they cover very dangerous assignments. So, no, I'm not that worried. Well, Yuri Kagayama, thank you. Thank you. Yuri Kagayama is an Associated Press reporter in the Tokyo Bureau. I'm Mina Kim. We have more news online at kqednews.org. 
When disaster strikes, some people are more vulnerable than others. The old, the very young, and the sick all require extra attention from emergency planners. In Japan, one such effort is focused on protecting dialysis patients. NHK World's Kohei Inoue reports. Yukio Nishiyama has a chronic kidney disease. He needs four hours of dialysis, three days a week. It's treatment that keeps him alive, and that's what worries him. The earthquake in northeastern Japan three years ago crippled some important medical lifelines. Hospital buildings were badly damaged. Nishiyama lives in Mie Prefecture, which was outside the disaster zone. But he worries what will happen if the next quake strikes his hometown. We can't stay alive without dialysis. This hospital is in the middle of Mie Prefecture. More than 300 patients receive dialysis here. The hospital has made disaster preparation a high priority. Water is critical for dialysis. A single treatment requires 120 liters. The hospital dug its own well to ensure a quake won't cut off its supply. To make sure the power stays on, a generator has been set up on the roof. The hospital has also installed a satellite telephone to keep communication lines open. This will allow other damaged facilities to refer patients. The greatest concern is how easy it is to get through to patients. If we can't contact them, there's nothing we can do. The city of Kobe was devastated by a massive quake two decades ago. Drawing on lessons learned from this and other natural disasters, the city is promoting an initiative between the local government and patients. On this day, a representative of local dialysis patients is visiting City Hall. This group handed in details on around a thousand people. If a quake strikes, this data will allow officials to check on patients and alert them to where they can get care and medicine. For patients, it's very reassuring. Hyogo Emergency Medical Center in Kobe would play a key role in the event of a disaster. Director Shinichi Nakayama says the bigger the emergency, the more important it becomes for medical institutions and local government to communicate closely. The local government needs to be fully aware of the number of patients, where they live, and where they are getting treatment. If all municipalities can do this, we can connect them all, and we can save lives. Saving lives by staying informed Emergency planners say they are putting the systems in place to give dialysis patients a fighting chance when disaster strikes. Kohei Inoue, NHK One. These researchers are developing new ways to use what's going down the drain. They've refined techniques for recycling sewage. They believe there might be profits down the pipe. Plump, ripe tomatoes. They're not from someone's garden. They were grown at a sewage treatment plant in central Japan. Researchers from a university in the area and local government officials have been carrying out tests since May. 
they irrigate the plants with water from the treatment facility. Methane gas produced by sludge solids is used to generate electricity. Heat produced during the process is used to keep the greenhouse warm. Carbon dioxide emitted by the burning methane gas is fed into the greenhouse through a duct. That helps promote the photosynthesis of tomato leaves. The yield is up 30 percent. The sugar content tends to be higher. This is the first system in the world to fully recycle sewage. Nothing is wasted. I think we can create new value here by combining energy production and food production. And researchers at a university in western Japan are conducting tests to see whether sewage can be used to power fuel cell vehicles. They are trying to make hydrogen fuel in the sewage treatment process. They do this in the lab by heating methane and treated sewage to 800 degrees Celsius. The resulting chemical reaction creates hydrogen. Researchers will give the process a trial run next year at a sewage treatment center in the area. The national government will pay the 13 million dollars needed to build the test facility. They plan to produce enough hydrogen in one day to power 70 fuel cell vehicles. In terms of producing and consuming energy locally, it's very significant that an urban area can produce this much energy. This is the first step in the huge task of creating a low-carbon society. Government officials see sewage treatment as a key part of Japan's infrastructure export strategy. They estimate the global market will grow to $355 billion in 10 years, and they see developing countries as their biggest potential customers. A sewer contains water and energy resources. Using them will help solve problems facing local communities. Where there are cities, there's sewage. People have high expectations for technology that helps communities use sewage as a resource and not just a waste product. for those students. The chairwoman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission spent the day in southwest Michigan touring Palisades and Cook Power Plants. Allison McFarlane and Congressman Fred Upton met with officials from both plants as they toured them. They wanted to see where the facilities are as they implement safety changes after the Fukushima disaster in Japan after the tsunami. Well, they say the discussions went very well and Cook seems to be ahead of Palisades. We had uh, thorough briefings about both plants. We had good tours of, of both facilities in general. Both facilities have their own sets of issues, uh, but each is performing well. Um, and, uh, and they're working on er areas that uh, we and they have identified uh, for improvement. McFarland says they're satisfied both plants are operating safely. You might remember Palisades has been shut down several times in recent years because of problems. And the NRC called it one of the four worst performing nuclear plants in the country. <laughs>
Thank you.